two years ago I started this journey, but this journey actually started 32 years ago. I was born in 1991, August. Mom's water actually broke back in, let's see, uh, June, yeah, two months early. We don't know why. Supposedly there was some sort of a virus that affected her pregnancy and just made everything go to pot. And then after I was born and mom tried to go back to the uh, OBGYN and try and get him for, for malpractice, he was already gone and already had a record a mile long. So, you know, um, but while my, my own mom was sitting in the hospital waiting for me to be born because I would, I would have died as soon as I came out if she'd have given birth immediately. The doctor has tried to convince her to get a partial birth abortion. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's basically where you get the head out and then they do away with the kid. And it's horrible. <clears throat> they used the medical issues I would face as the reasoning, but I called it what it was, an excuse to uh, basically try and get me to not make it. The enemy was hard at work. I was diagnosed with health, health issues, including a collapsed left lung, which they had to reinflate, a blood infection, which required a full transfusion, as well as other possible complications because of the manner of my birth. I was a C-section, but when I was born, I had nothing but a pocket of fluid around my face. If they'd waited any longer, I probably wouldn't have made it. The fact that I did says a whole lot about what God can do with a whole lot less. <laughs> Mom almost died too, so, you know, eh. and, and you know, the funny thing is, there's a funny story with this. The doctors asked my dad, who was present at the time, if we can only save one, which one should we save? And he said, Mom. And when Mom heard this, she's like, oh, you messed up. I've already lived my life. This one hasn't even had a day. What are you thinking? <laughs> she let him have it. <laughs> it wasn't the last time she did that either. I had to be resuscitated over 10 times in the course of the two months that I stayed in the hot, well, September, October, three months, because I didn't come back until right after Thanksgiving. I was put on a feeding tube because I didn't have the swallowing reflex babies are usually born with. I ended up in speech therapy, and I had to be taught later how to actually swallow and, and eat. Um... I made it home in time for Thanksgiving, that, well, no, right after Thanksgiving that year, but extended family was so afraid to even touch me because they thought I was so fragile I'd break. Hmm. That ended up being my relationship with most of my extended family for a long time, unfortunately. More is the pity for them because I think I'm pretty, pretty fun to be around. I came home to my dad and two older sisters. The funny thing is, my older sister liked me before I came home. And after I came home, she's like, I don't want anything to do with him. While my second sister was the opposite. <laughs> we don't know why. <clears throat> dad was never emotionally available. And he began develop. I began developing my first resentments towards him thanks to emotional neglect. Um, Mom always supported and loved me and always wanted to encourage me. She was actually the one that basically encouraged me to do whatever came to my fancy. Um, up until school age, I don't remember very memory, many memories that were positive. I remember quite a lot of negative ones, though, that I put in my past. But the traumatic I had, traumatic experiences I had mainly centered around dad being not the greatest and various medical emergencies that came up. Basically, I had a lot of, um, I had a lot of tendency to choke on things. <laughs> it was like every other week they were trying to get something out of my lungs or out of my throat. It's horrible. Um, started, I started early intervention, intervention at the Discovery Center, I think around three or four years old. It's basically a program for kids that need a bit of extra help going into even pre, even kindergarten. So um, my gym teacher at the time was very helpful in teaching me motor skills, including how to skip. He was so proud of me the day I learned how to skip in, 
it's like that's such a small thing for a lot of a lot of folks, but for me, he was so happy that I could do it. Um, started going to preschool at six, but I got held back because I was antisocial. Basically, I did not talk, and I didn't. Well, I did talk. I talked way too quickly for most people to understand me. Sometimes I still do, depending on the day. Um, I realized part of the problem with that was because I didn't feel heard a lot at home. My older sisters had their lives going on because they were teenagers. My mom was exhausted from having to take care of the house all day. And, well, like I said before, Dad was just pretty much emotionally unavailable. He didn't want anything to do with me for the most part. That was unfortunate. Another part of me, another part of that was kids in school bullying me for being different. That didn't change much during my during my later school years, unfortunately. At the age of six or seven, I was finally able to be taken off of the feeding tube. But the doctors were worried about my weight. So they told mom to encourage me to eat whatever hit my fancy. At the time, one of the first things I latched on to was dairy. So my first addiction became food, especially dairy and sugar. Great. At age eight, I was put in a special needs class because of behavior problems I had. Part of that was my attention span suffering because the way I learned didn't match with a traditional school classroom. And the other part was my anger because I started to lash out at the other kids when they would bully me. I remember one kid especially that I treated horribly and he didn't even bully me. It was just an easy target. <laughs> Um, around this time was when dad started getting more physically abusive. Beforehand, he was mainly just verbally mean, making comments about me being stupid and not understanding things that he thought were simple. Well, I could say the same thing about him nowadays, but I don't because he's getting up there. He eventually became violent. Years of drug and alcohol abuse had turned him into a mean stranger rather than the loving father I'd always wished for. I ended up being told that I needed to be on medi needed to be on medication for my ADHD. The school told my mom that I wasn't allowed back unless I was on something to make me behave. So I saw a doctor and was placed on Ritalin. It turned me into another person completely. It made me a monstrous bully. Even worse than I already was. Mom quickly refused to give it to me and demanded something be done. So the next pill was Adderall. It helped more, but it made me a zombie. So they had to take that back a bit in order to make me calm, but not comatose, if that makes sense. That ended up being the best, best possible medicine, according to the doctor, for that period of time. During this time, I was also developing strange behaviors around, well, sexual things because my upbringing wasn't the best and because I had started finding my dad's materials because he wouldn't leave them out everywhere. I remember this now because mom actually asked the doctor about getting help because it seemed to be a bit concerning. The doctor said there wasn't anything to worry about. I really wish they would have taken a bit more of a look, but okay. I became confused about these new things I didn't understand. I had so much information, but none of it se seemed to make any sense to me. At nine, at nine years old, I ended up being sent to juvenile detention because according to the principal of the school, I had disrespected him. Mom had to pick me up at after the staff there called her because they said I didn't belong there that young. The youngest children they had there were 12. They didn't usually have nine-year-olds in the cells. In fact, I didn't go to a cell. I kept, they kept me in the uh, common areas and just waited until mom came to pick me up. It didn't help that the principal also didn't call mom before sending me, which didn't exactly follow rules at all. <laughs> My life is a, a series of just not following the rules. 
And after this, I was sent to Adriel School, which is actually used to be up here in West Liberty, up on the hill, where I met the police chief at the time, Ron Murray. Well, I don't know if he was chief yet, but he was still part of the police force. Ron Murray. He took an interest in me and tried his best to support and teach me. He was the first major male influence in my life that was positive. Oh, poor thing. Over the years, he did his best to keep me on the right path. Whether or not he did was <laughs> totally my choice. At age 12, I made a friend with a neighbor boy a couple years older than me. I think he was like 15 or 16 at the time. He liked video games like I did. And we played games at his house a lot. He also had other games we would play. I didn't know it at the time, but I realize now that he was grooming me into being in a homosexual relationship with him. I will admit some things were in initiated by me. I knew he had more knowledge than I did about things, so I'd asked him about the strange feelings I started to have when I would see one of Dad's magazines. He offered to teach me, and being as naive as I was, I said yes trusting that someone like him wouldn't hurt me. It started slowly, but eventually grew into something out of my control, and I didn't know how to get him to stop. He'd never done anything below the belt until one day he invited me into the woods where he said he'd found something cool he wanted to share with me. At 12 years old, I lost my innocence to a guy who manipulated me into thinking it was okay. Only when it happened and when I was in pain from the aftermath did I realize that it was not. I became even more unstable, unable to come, with a ter come to terms with what happened to me. <clears throat> I sought connection with peers in ways that did not help either of us. Because of this, I ended up in the juvenile probation system as well as mandatory therapy for underage children. This was hopefully to rehabilitate me enough to not be a danger to myself or others. I have made amends to those who have been hurt by me, but I realize that the pain will likely be lasting. From there, my emotions and actions went into insanity having been hurt so deeply and viscerally, and having so much rage built up, I began lashing out at my parents. First on my dad in response to his drunken rages, nearly coming to blows with him several times. Then with mom directing my anger at her without cause. Sometimes I wonder just how much pain I put her through. The bullying intensified after I transferred schools again, this time to Maccachete Learning Center. The classes were smaller, but that just made me a bigger target. The bullying wasn't physical, but it definitely became more verbal. Mom finally contacted the doctor and convinced him to get me off of the Adderall. She asked about a non-narcotic solution, and the doctor recommended Stratera. The only catch was that I would need to detox from the Adderall for two months. Mom describes it as hell. I would agree, based on my recollection, which isn't much. And this time I should mention my father was no longer living with us. Mom had gotten a divorce thanks to a woman's advocate when I was eight after he pinned her down and tried to choke her to death. I remember watching the whole thing from the bathroom doorway, scared to move in fear of him coming after me. He didn't leave the house until I was about 10 and then came back, of course. The next few years were somewhat uneventful. I developed friendships and relationships with others my age, though with, though with much trouble since my mind had trouble connecting with others thanks to the psychological trauma I had been through. As... <laughs> hey, James. 
At 16, my feeding tube site reopened because the doctor had told my mom to just let it close up by itself. It had never completely healed. Combined with the weight gain, I had stretched out the scar tissue enough that a pinhole opened up. It burned quite a lot. Stomach acid isn't meant to be on the skin. <laughs> um, I went to a surgeon to get it taken care of. During surgery, I believed I had an encounter with God. Because this would happen again later when I had my gastric sleeve surgery. I don't remember the details, but I remember finding peace. Feeling peace. And waking up with a sense that God wanted to use me. Unfortunately, this feeling would not last long. Shortly after this, my past caught up with me again. One of the people I had heard after being raped came forward to press charges. I was sent to an inpatient rehab on recommendation of my therapist, who had always been less than satisfied with the work I put into mandatory therapy. I had resentments towards her for a number of years, but finally let go because I understood her perspective was not ne necessarily a complete one. During my stay in rehab, I was put through a program much like the 12 steps, participating in group therapy with other young people. I refused to acknowledge that I was in any way the same as them, claiming it was only my trauma that pushed me into doing what I had and that I had no control. Eventually realizing that I would never be able to leave unless I gave them what they wanted, I eventually began to learn the program and follow it, if only in the word and not in spirit. After a year, I was coming to a point where I was about ready to graduate from the program. At this stage, I began to forget what it was like on the outside. The thought of facing the world at large again frightened me. I was paralyzed with fear at the prospect of being out of control. My fear caused me to seek a way to avoid leaving, so I acted out so that they would give me more time inside. I got six extra months. When I was finally released from rehab, I had just turned 18. My dad had also just been sent to jail for possession of child pornography. My world was devastated again. I began to blame myself. If I hadn't done what I had in response to my pain when I was younger, would he have been inclined to do what he did? I couldn't know, but I thought I did. During that last year of school, Mark started taking me to church. I slowly began to see God's presence in my life. But I was still determined to do things my way. <laughs> because, of course. <laughs> ah, children. I finished my, year, my senior year of high school and was, wait. Yeah. I thought I skipped a page. I finished my year, my senior year of high school and was released from probation. Now I really didn't know what to do. I had no structure anymore for my life, so what could I do? I began to dive into the world of technology. The internet had finally become available to me, and I relished in it. It became an obsession, driven by a need to fill the gap between me and whatever I thought could fulfill me. That obsession would eventually lead me back to my first addiction, pornography. It would quickly become an obsession and a dependency for me, something that I felt I couldn't do without, that I needed as a sustainer for my very existence. I didn't know it, but I was slowly chaining myself to the idol of lust. On my 21st birthday, I was gifted several sampler bottles of alcohol to celebrate. I realize now that downing all of them the same night should have been a warning that I couldn't handle it. However, I thought, well, it's my birthday. Who cares? This would begin a nine-year binge of drinking and trying to run away from my problems. In 2012, I was awarded Social Security Disability thanks to various mental and physical health problems that made working nearly impossible. Because of this, I had endless amounts of free time on my hands and a steady income that would enable my habit. I've calculated the expenses of my drinking over the years to, 
to have been more than enough to pay it a, pay a down payment on a house if I'd saved it. In 2016, I began making videos on YouTube, having been inspired by others on the site who were making a living just entertaining people. I sought to feel like I was worth something, and I sought validation from outside of myself. Since I was young, I had dreamed of being an actor, but even now, I had a chance at doing something similar. My channel never did take off, even though I did everything I could. In 2019, I went to Lima to get bariatric surgery for weight loss. While I was in surgery, I again remember feeling that sense of comfort and love. But this time, I didn't have the feeling that God was going to use me. This drove me into a depression. I felt I had lost my connection to him. My life began to spiral. Even though I was volunteering at my church and doing work I felt was valuable, I was miserable in my home life. I began to have insomnia and had trazodone prescribed by my doctor. For two years after that, I was rolling the dice every time I went to sleep because I was mis mixing alcohol and sleeping pills which is a recipe for disaster in many cases. When COVID came around in 2020, my social circle, which was already small, began getting smaller. My isolation became so great that the only places I would go were church, the doctor, and the store. I was becoming more withdrawn, and I began drinking more. I also began smoking weed, thinking it would help. It just made me tired. Eventually, in 2021, I decided I was done trying to get better. My weight was still awful, my vision was getting worse, and my addictions were still controlling me. I had just gotten a refill of Trazodone, and I decided that night I would take a handful of pills, finish off my alcohol, and go to sleep forever. Well, I was unconscious. I remember feeling the most excruciating pain in my entire life. I had had, chronic, I had had chronic pain from my back and joints for years, but this felt like that pain was a tingling sensation compared to why, what I was feeling. I remember crying out for mercy, just agony in my very breath. Then I remember a voice like rocks crushing against each other saying, do you, really think, do you really think you deserve mercy? Do you really think anyone cares? You put yourself here. You deserve this. I remember beginning to agree with that voice, which I know now was the enemy, when I heard another voice say, not this one. He's not yours. Be at peace, my child. I remember feeling light surround me, and then I woke up with no memory of what I had heard or seen, just the feeling that I didn't want to go through it again. I spent that whole day angry that I was alive, having no memory of the mercy shown to me. When I asked that night why God let me live, he gave me the only audible response I've gotten from him. Who are you to think that you can change my plans for you? You can't. You need to follow me. I immediately recognized who I was talking to and admitted he had a point. I wasn't, I wasn't ready to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you, but I admitted he had a point. From then on, I avoided alcohol, but I still struggled to find a path forward. That autumn, I found the tent revival and the sign for life recovery. I had tried Overeaters Anonymous years ago and it had limited success, but I was willing to try again if only to find something that worked. This October, I celebrated two years sober. And while I still have work to do, my life is much better off now than it was at the beginning of this journey. God has made all the difference between who I was and who I am.